so thank you all very much uh, for bearing with us uh, in what will probably be something of an experiment. You could say an unmoderated conversation. But nonetheless, obviously, uh, we did discuss beforehand that we'll try to uh, bring some structure to the conversation. Um, so this is about financial stability. So it's not going to be a cheery uh, part of the program. But let me start on a positive note. If somebody had told me two, two and a half years ago that the global community of central banks was about to raise rates by roughly uh, 500 basis points on average within a period of slightly more than 12 months and then would hold rates at that level for a significant period of time. And the only true financial instabilities that we've seen so far is a set of second tier US banks that were kept out of the international regulatory perimeter plus one significant Swiss institution but an institution that already had a, a significant amount of governance related issues that had nothing to do with the pivot in monetary policy, I would have immediately have signed up to it. Now, again, this is not a panel to be self-congratulatory, uh, and luckily uh, we have Richard uh, amongst us. Luckily we had the BIS this weekend uh, reminding us that between the end of a hiking cycle and the first period in which financial instabilities can begin to manifest itself, usually a bit more time uh, needs to pass. So there are still lots and lots of financial instabilities or at least financial vulnerabilities in our parlance, financial vul vulnerabilities around there uh, that we should worry about. And this is actually going to be the subject of, of the conversation that my good friend Lucetia and, uh, and I are uh, about to have. Now, before we go into these financial vulnerabilities, uh, Lucetia, a lot of the discussion, of course, so far has focused on ECB monetary policy in relation to the Fed and other central banks. But we haven't discussed so much uh, the experience from South Africa and, let's say, uh, the emerging market perspective. So how do you look at this issue of monetary policy synchronization versus monetary policy divergence from a South African perspective? Well, maybe before I could talk about the South African perspective, I just want to take this a little bit further because the divergence that you have seen uh, is not just in advanced economies. You have also seen divergence uh, in uh, emerging market, uh, uh, market economies. But also, emerging market uh, economies uh, fared much better than in previous episodes. And um, what had been the distinguishing factor, uh, the, what made the, the, the emerging markets resilience first had been uh, the issue of policy frameworks. Um, inflation targeting does work. And uh, in countries that had implemented inflation targeting flexibly and uh, more robustly, they had been able to, uh, to fare much better. And I think that it is that that explains why emerging markets uh, were the first ones to start tightening monetary policy before advanced economies uh, work. If you are an emerging market uh, a central bank, uh, you are used to volatility of output and, uh, and inflation. And when you see inflation beginning to rise, uh, you know it is coming. You have to run surveys and try to impute these things from um, uh, market uh, expectations. Bottom line is that uh, once the public start talking about the high cost of living, you know that inflation has become a problem. And what has become also useful had been a public, global public survey that was done by a surveying company that actually established that um, uh, the public has become increasingly intolerable uh, of inflation. But something happened in South Africa that I never thought uh, would happen before, which happened in 2022, where there was a public demonstration against the high cost of living. Um, interestingly, that public demonstration didn't come to the central bank. It went to the presidency. I almost wanted to say wrong address. You should have come here, and then I would have shown you uh, what to do, uh, uh, what to do with that. A second point had been that 
the divergence in emerging markets has not just been about the stance of monetary policy. It also had to do with the policy experience. Those which, who had bad policies fared really bad uh, 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 during this uh, uh, episode. And those who didn't have buffers uh, actually suffered. And unfortunately, those who do not have buffers, even if they had good policies, um, they suffered. But it had to do in the main because these were really uh, developing uh, uh, countries and low income, uh, low income countries. The third point that I explained the resilience had been that the US response to this episode was also good. You might say that they acted late, but when they acted, they acted resolutely, which meant that global inflation peaked at lower rates compared to what we saw uh, in the 70s, but also de policy didn't have to tighten as much as it happened uh, in the uh, 70s, and as such, didn't quite experience a recession. And the last point, uh, class, that I would like to, uh, uh, to make, uh, since uh, we are focused on financial stability, um, I say to my chaps in the financial stability department, I pay you for one thing. So don't t come here and tell me things are okay. Tell me what to worry about. So uh, I'm trying to find something that I could worry about. And I asked them, what should I worry about? And the one thing that had come, uh, class, is what could actually go wrong? And the question that then uh, comes to me had to do with the levels of debt and the trajectory that the debt uh, could follow. To put it into context, the OECD Global Debt Report states that um, Debt in OECD, bond market debt in OECD countries in 2024 will rise to $56 trillion. If you take that back to 2008, it's an increase of $30 trillion. Of that debt, 40% is maturing within the next three years, and that is sovereign debt. Corporate debt, 37% of that is maturing within the next uh, three years. So whether it is repaid or it is refinanced, and I think most likely it would be re refinanced, is going to be refinanced at rates that are higher than what that debt uh, was raised. And that could raise potential uh, issues. And my question to you, Tlas, with you being the chair of the Financial Stability Board, uh, but also being the governor of a central bank in uh, the euro system, is to what extent you are concerned about the financial stability risks that could emanate from this elevated debt situation and the trajectory that it follows? Well, uh, Lesetia, let me begin by saying that, that obviously uh, the risk of high indebtedness is clearly not a risk that is uh, restricted to emerging markets only. Uh, we've seen an episode uh, in the UK related to a very rapid repricing of a public debt uh, trajectory in, a, in an advanced uh, economy. Um, there is no escaping from the notion also at the lunch conversations, etc., that the issue of fiscal policy and, and sovereign debt is back uh, on, uh, on many people's uh, radars. It is indeed true uh, that uh, countries differ very much in terms of the average maturity of borrowing, fixed rate versus flexible rate borrowing. So the day of the reckoning can be postponed by having a lot of fixed rate borrowing. But if the inflation outlook is such that the rates will continue to have to be high for an elevated, uh, uh, for an extended period of time, then of course at some point that roll rollover risk uh, will manifest itself. And I think there is still uh, quite some rollover risk uh, in, uh, in the pipeline here. Now, you mentioned high indebtedness. Uh, this is, of course, not the only financial stability vulnerability that we worry about. By the way, in our parlance, uh, we talk about financial stability risks as being the confluence of shocks, which we cannot predict because we don't know where they come from, and vulnerabilities, which we can actually manage and, uh, and, and, and try to, uh, to remedy. Other financial vulnerabilities that I could think about are of course, have, of course, to do with the still quite rich valuations in financial markets. 
And the question then that comes to mind there is, for instance, is a risk like geopolitical risk, the risk of geoeconomic fragmentation, is that risk sufficiently priceable by markets? Have markets uh, taken that risk sufficiently into account? Suppose that were to give rise to a correction, what would then happen with the, uh, let's say, the non-bank financial system? So far, uh, the core of the financial system, the banking sector, has uh, managed relatively well, uh, in part, I will say, because of the financial reform agenda that we rolled out after the global financial crisis. But there, are, there is a host of issue in the non-bank sector, which is different from the banking sector, because it's not so much about capital, but it is about liquidity mismatches, and uh, definitely, if they are combined also with forms of, uh, of hidden leverage uh, popping, uh, popping up. So that's a vulnerability that I would ask uh, attention for. And of course, geopolitical risk also lead to more active, let's say, cyber risks, uh, uh, more involvement of state actors in, in, uh, in, in, in cyber uh, attacks. And then, of course, there is also the issue, what does it do with capital flows? Uh, you are a representative of an emerging market. So to what extent can these vulnerabilities also give rise to more volatile capital flows? And that would be my question to you, uh, Lesetia. From an emerging market perspective, do you worry about NBFI and capital flows? You know, I was about to uh, interject you, Lars, and, and come uh, back to, uh, to one thing. Uh, because we keep on giving the child a new name. You know, this thing was, uh, we were worried about shadow banking. Then we said, no, no, maybe it's not quite shadow banking. It's bank-like financial institutions. Then we said, no, no, maybe that's not quite the term. Let's call it market-based financing. And then now we're calling it the NBFI. You know, it's the same child, OK? Uh, it, it's, just, it's just having different names uh, 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 all the time. And the, 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 the thing for, for me when you say, are you worried about capital flows? I ask myself, because you see, I spent a lot of time going to key world financial centers uh, to try and get investors to put their money in the South African economy, whether it is in the bond market and in the equity market. Then I come to a conference like this last, and then you tell me about the dangers of capital flows. Then I ask myself, which part of my job is bad now? Because <laughs> I have to go around trying to get capital to come to uh, my country only for me to come to the meeting to tell me that capital flows are so bad they might actually lead to uh, financial, uh, financial instability. But point here is that capital flows are easier to manage if you have robust policy framework such that capital goes into the areas where it is supposed to go. Well, let me give you the South African example. So in the 2000s, in the build up to the uh, a great financial crisis, the bulk of capital flows that were coming into South Africa were non-debt creating flows going into the equity uh, market because they were looking for growth and they were all, some of them were looking for infrastructure. We got into the period uh, after 2009, a period in South Africa that we characterize as state capture where bad policies started to set in and uh, the nature of the flows changed and they tended to be more debt creating flows and they tended to go to state-owned enterprises which almost turned out to be zombies and government had to uh, bail, them, uh, bail them out. So the point that I wanted to drive to is with a prudent macro policy framework, rule of law, functioning institutions, and so forth, capital flows uh, would be good. Capital flows can reverse, but they reverse because of the nature of global finance. If there is a concern about risks, capital will flow away from the risk and go to where either risk is low or the returns are, uh, are better. And so, so, so that is what you would actually be, uh, you would be actually faced with. So to the extent that there would be countries that are 
worried about capital flows, it would be that, well, maybe we know the policies are bad and capital might just flow out. Because if the policies are good, these things seem to be men, mean reverting. And so capital would flow out and it would flow back in. And our experience had been to allow the exchange rate to take this shock on behalf of the economy. So when capital flows out, the exchange rates uh, depreciate, and when they return, the exchange rates uh, appreciate. But it becomes also particularly important uh, for us when this becomes a shop absorber because most of the major emerging markets now do not suffer from what Ricardo Hausmann called the original sin. These flows are, tend to be denominated in domestic currency. So when there is an outflow, the investors would know that if they have just moved out, out of panic, not because the policy has changed, there is a price to pay, because those who stay behind get to experience better returns. Well, in that sense, uh, Lesetia, huh? let me remind you also that the fact that we moved away from the word shadow banking was exactly an, sort of to underline huh, that this word perhaps had a, a little bit too much a negative huh, uh, connotation. So there is nothing wrong with sort of market-based finance in that sense. Uh, that's why we try to move away from a more neutral term, well, non-bank financial intermediation. It's not the greatest of all terms, but at least uh, it, it was meant to illustrate that actually there's nothing wrong with capital market finance in and of itself. Uh, on the contrary, I think uh, with my European head on, I would say we could use a little bit more uh, capital market financing uh, uh, rather than uh, this heavily bank-dominated financial system that we, currently, uh, that we currently have. But it is interesting that the concept of resilience, of course, in, uh, in the NBFI space is a different concept than the one in the banking uh, sector. Uh, in the banking sector, it's much more focused on buffers, on capital within the core institution. Within the NBFI space, this is much more heterogeneous. It's about liquidity imbalances. It's about managing such uh, liquidity imbalances. It is about strengthening the core players like investment funds, money market funds, uh, etc. But it's definitely also about some cross-cutting issues like liquidity preparedness for margin and collateral calls. Uh, we saw a lot of that in March 2020. Uh, it is about pockets of hidden leverage. Think about the Archegos. Uh, case uh, that manifested itself. So it's much more diverse. It's much more about sort of uh, making sure that the markets are be brought in a position where they can price uh, the, risk, uh, uh, the risk accordingly, rather than uh, focusing solely on, uh, on the entities. Now it's the trick- that that's, that's a very important point, but <clears throat> this as you talk about this, this, so we talk about this flows, one of the things that we, established as the following. South Africa is very far from uh, Ukraine, and yet when Russia invaded Ukraine, capital flew out of uh, South Africa, it flowed out of uh, other emerging markets. So clearly now, the issue of the geopolitics and geofragmentation uh, plays uh, uh, its role. Uh, it becomes a challenge. How do you think about geofragmentation and how you th think it could be impacting on uh, this area of work? Well, actually, I think uh, geoeconomic fragmentation has, of course, real effects on trade and uh, on uh, impeding technology diffusion, which has a negative effect on productivity growth on either side of the fence. But if I take it uh, more into the financial stability uh, area, the biggest drawback I see from uh, geoeconomic fragmentation is that most of the challenges that we are being faced with, most with the, of the, let's say, financial vulnerabilities, are truly global in nature and can only be remedied with a global approach, with a global cooperative approach where everybody is willing to play his or her uh, role. That is the reason why the FSB was established. That was also the reason why the Financial Stability Board in 2009 became a G20 committee. Uh, its forerunner was the Financial Stability Forum, which was a G7 plus uh, forum. The, G the Financial Stability Board is a G20 plus institution, and that was meant to reflect that the challenges that we face are truly global in nature. Think about climate, think about crypto. Another uh, reason to worry a little bit, I think, is that when it comes to crisis management, 
imagine that we would have another global financial crisis, 2007, 2008. We all remember uh, the Pittsburgh 2009 summit where sort of countries came together and agreed on a, a globally concerted sort of policy response. Would it be possible in today's world to come up with a similar response if a crisis like that were to repeat itself? Or would we first enter into a phase of recriminations, of mistrust, etc.? So the potential, and uh, the, the lower potential for international cooperation, that for me is the largest financial stability risk that I see emanating from this geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, fragmentation. Now this is very much from the FSB's perspective, but as you are well aware, you will be, you as South Africa will be taken over the G20 presidency next year. And my observation is that this is actually also, to some extent, hampering the effectiveness of the G20. So do you have any plans already huh, in, uh, let's say, in shape for next year, how you want to go about this when you have to chair the G20? Well, um, T20 for think tanks, Y20 for youth, W20 for women, L20 for labor ministers, 2020, 2020. This is becoming a big industry. <laughs> and so, so we want about this that what you have is that the G20 agenda keeps on adding up. Nothing gets dropped. The stuff that the G20 was found to deal with, we still have to deal with those. And yet, there is more and more added uh, onto, uh, onto the agenda. And just thinking about the South African agenda as we go in, uh, into the, uh, into the uh, 2025, we look at this and uh, uh, I, I look back. And you know, I did this as a young civil servant, but if the work of the G20 is going to be reduced to negotiating a communique, we have a problem. We are not dealing with global issues that are confronting us. And any country could find one paragraph in the communique that they do not like, and we will have no communique. So why, why travel? Why travel for 16 and a half hours to listen to people argue about one paragraph and then eventually decide, OK, chairman, you can go and make your own statement. Well, you could have as well just sat at home and asked the chairman to make the statement, right? But we are reducing the G20 to a communique thing. Can we look back and say that what is the agenda of the G20? And obviously, this thing has been elevated to the heads of state. I, I am, that is above my pay grade. So whatever I'm going to be telling you is what we are trying to do with uh, the... Uh, the finance track, uh, which I'm coming to think uh, uh, of it, that the FSB's value add was having the treasuries in the room, the central banks in the room, the regulators in the room, and I'm afraid that the treasuries, apart from the ministers, below the treasuries are starting to um, uh, drop their level of participation in the FSB, because that is the work, the finance track, has really migrated to the FSB. And if the G20 was to look back and say, what are the achievements of the G20 since the, global the, the great financial crisis, you will find that it is the finance track, the regulatory uh, reform agenda. That is what, uh, uh, that is what, uh, you know. now that we talked about the debt, I mean, there is debt distress now in low uh, income uh, 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 countries, it is a concern. Uh, the G20 common framework sounded great in design. It is too slow. It is not quite working for the countries that are in, uh, in distress. And it doesn't take into account that there is a lack of capacity in many of those low-income countries to successfully negotiate with well-resourced creditors. And maybe what we should be thinking about is who is the broker that could come in uh, into, the, uh, into the room. The IMF tried uh, before, there was a, a, a pushback, but maybe we could get the IMF to work then on the side of the countries rather. 
and help the countries to be able to prepare themselves uh, into that. The second part of the, the finance track, which is a, a, a important for us, this is the first time that an African country would be chairing the G20 at a, 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 leaders, a, a leaders' summit. And um, one of the things that uh, we established had been that um, the African continent corridors of remittances are amongst the most expensive uh, uh, around. And we are going to be spending time uh, on not adding new things to the payment agenda because I co-chair the CPC in the FSB just to lift that agenda and, um, and take it to the next level. We have set targets for 2027 and for 2030. We have only had two years now. I don't think that we should be despondent because we spent the time sorting out the measures uh, uh, and so forth. And that that is the work that we would like to uh, we would like to uh, uh, to take forth. And uh, lastly, is that um, because work on the finance track had almost migrated to the FSB, it's almost you guys can talk about those in the FSB. Um, here we would like to deal with other things and to just make sure that the FSB continues to play a meaningful role in the G20 agenda. But just proceeding on this, uh, this global payments uh, roadmap, which I believe is absolutely crucial and is very, very, very essential. At the same time, South Africa is also part of the BRICS, you know, the famous abbreviation. Uh, and what we are reading in the press is that actually, uh, and here I think uh, geoeconomic, geopolitical fragmentation and payments sort of uh, come together that the BRICS are thinking about setting up their own uh, payment system. Uh, so my question to you would be, how does that relate to this, uh, this work in the G20 where we try to combine uh, a fast payment system, where we try to work on global interoperability and at the same time building these, these separate structures? Can these two be sort of reconciled? Well, if you, if you, if you doubted whether sanctions work, uh, this is it. It might have worked in the wrong direction, but they work. Right, so, so, so um, finance has been, so to say, weaponized and you're cutting people out of key systems, they will find alternatives. I do not think that the economics makes sense, but when you start to say to people you are going to be cut out of uh, global finance, people will create a different environment. And we must think carefully about whether this is an instrument we wanted, uh, we wanted, uh, we wanted to use. I got worried when um, I had to speak to some reserve managers and they were talking about, oh, reserves can be seized. We better start looking elsewhere. Let's look at alternative markets. Let's look at different custodianship and so forth. We are going to have, we are going to have a, a, a fragmentation. Does that mean that we should not be working towards a, 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 a framework that would enable all of us to, uh, to, uh, to, to get? Absolutely not. We should continue uh, the work because it is those of us who are on the fringes of the global financial system who will end up being, paying the price uh, for, uh, uh, for the fragmentation. Excellent. So I think this was a very huh, good example of how you see that uh, uh, yeah, uh, geopolitical risks are actually interfering with the work of a global platform like the, uh, like the Financial Stability Board. I could add uh, just one more area before I think we should also draw in a little bit of the audience. Uh, and that, is, of course, has to do with digital currencies and particularly crypto uh, currencies. That's another area where in today's world, eh, I believe you can take a server under your arm to any place in the world, you plug into the internet, and you can start issuing uh, crypto assets. So eh, the FSB has come forward with uh, two sets of recommendations. One set of recommendations for a global regulatory framework for crypto assets and crypto asset activities, and another one for global stablecoin uh, arrangements. But of course, the strength of these recommendations will only be decided by yeah, the scope of its implementation. If we allow yeah, non-cooperative jurisdictions to continue to function and attract these crypto uh, asset activity, 
then probably huh, we will not be able to deliver on uh, on, on 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 the goals uh, that we've uh, that we've set ourselves in this uh, area, and I think this is one more uh, area where we have to make sure that whatever is happening in the world, that we try to fight each other at the FSB table and that we come to a common understanding that we have enough information sharing across uh, countries. Uh, because in many of the emerging markets, you're well aware of the concerns that, for instance, US dollar denominated global stable coins would take over part of the, of the payment system in, uh, in, 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 in these countries. That's, a, I think, a concern that we should take very, very, uh, very seriously. And then a final uh, example where I think global cooperation is, is absolutely key, and that has to do with climate change. Uh, there is only one global uh, climate. And in that extent, to that extent, I also wanted to ask you, Lesetia, because South Africa is a, in a little bit in a peculiar position when it comes to climate change. On the one hand, uh, you stand to suffer quite a bit from climate change, uh, temperature, rising temperatures, drought, floods, etc. At the same time, your energy mix is still heavily dominated by coal. There are issues with energy outages uh, in the country, etc. How do you sort of navigate between these, these two challenges? Um, it's the same. The, the only reason we have economists is to help us deal with trade-offs. And um, uh, otherwise, we do not need economists, OK? Um, so, 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 so we face the trade-offs, and this, some of these trade-offs are intertemporal. Um, and, and so we, we have, we have um, as you correctly pointed out, an energy system that is very much based on, uh, on coal. In the short term, we are going to need those power stations that are fired uh, by coal. In the medium to long term, we are making the transition. Our just energy transition plan is well thought out, and uh, we think that uh, it would be as good. And these short-term trade-offs are very important, and since we are in Europe. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, what happened? You were going to face a cold winter, and uh, what, what did, I didn't even hear the narrative change. All that I saw was that the parts of South Africa were very busy carrying coal to, uh, to Europe. It was correct, because you couldn't say to Europe, it's transition, it's transition from uh, hydrocarbons at all costs. You were facing a situation where you needed energy now, and you had to get that coal. That is exactly the challenge that we face in South Africa. We are facing an energy shortage, and we have got a resource called coal. And so the, to the extent that we are not building new coal-fired power, uh, uh, coal power stations, we are just getting the existing ones to continue to work. We are making this uh, transition, give you this uh, perspective. In 2022, we generated 2.3 gigawatts of renewable energy. By 2024, we are generating 5.9 gigawatts of renewable energy. Our national energy regulator says that the projects currently underway will add another nine gigaw uh, gigawatts uh, to the grid. So the transition is taking place. And part of it had to do with the fact that we were facing the constrained energy situation, and yet the fastest way to deal with it was to actually bring in, uh, bring in uh, renewables. I wouldn't say that um, uh, because we have, it's, we do have wind, but in the main is solar. Uh, I won't say to the UK that they must do solar. I'm sure they can do it and it would work. But we have got like 350 days of sunlight, right? So, so it's a competitive advantage. So uh, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can do that. And that is the transition that we are making. Excellent. So there is still some time left for questions. For, I think we touched upon a very, very wide range of subjects. But any questions you may have on, let's say, global financial stability related matters? Who wants to take the floor? Well, Richard, please. Yes. 
We take a couple of questions and then uh, if there are more, please raise your hand. Yes, Harold, okay. Thank Richard. you, I'll, I'll just start with a remark on one of the initial statements that, um, that was made about who's responsible for inflation. Well, I'll tell you, when inflation is going up, it's the central bank. When it's coming down, it's the government. And that's what we found out in the United Kingdom. That's the it's part of the story that's been told in our election campaign. Anyway, um, I'll pass on to the real issues, which are uh, macroprudential. And um, two points. One, um, I'd ask you, you we're talking about volatility of capital flows and to some extent the role of non-bank financial intermediaries. Um, is there, in your view, both of you, um, is there a role, should there be a role for capital controls um, as part of the macro pru uh, uh, armory? And the second issue uh, is on global payments, and I, 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 I'll, I'll put that together with Klaus's remarks about crypto. Um, I would be concerned that uh, these stable coins uh, could become a significant vehicle for uh, international transfers uh, that would be really outside the uh, outside the domain, outside the control, outside the, the regulatory perimeter, uh, and is that something that worries you? Excellent. The gentleman over here. This was wonderful, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, if we didn't already have this language of advanced economies and emerging markets, <laughs> do you think we'd have the current grouping of countries into these groups? And if we were trying to do this, how would you define an emerging market in terms of policy terms. What is it that makes these countries different from advanced economies? Excellent question, thank you. Um, there, Harold, yeah. The Governor Nago, you spoke about the weaponization of the financial system and I very much agree with that perspective and, and how that's going to potentially change the financial system in the future. I'm, I'm hoping you can elaborate a little bit more on that. And in that context, maybe also, you know, get back at the crypto question that, uh, that Richard Portis uh, raised. Um, I mean, some countries view crypto as an opportunity as rather than, rather than a danger, right? Because it offers an alternative to the controllable financial system. And we have seen what happens with control of the financial system. El Salvador has tried, not very successfully. But is this an option for South Africa, or how, what your stance on that? Okay. Maybe you go, and then I'll pick up the pieces where you leave. Well, I wanted uh, you to pick up the crypto and the um, global stable coins, and then since there was a specific qu question about South Africa, I'll come on that. And I thought that I will take the other two. Uh, advanced economies, emerging market economies, um, you know, uh, I go through the data, and I found that uh, the IMF and the World Bank has this language, uh, low income, middle income, upper middle income, uh, uh, right? At the end of the day, for me, it is, I look at our country and say, where are we relative to other countries in the world? And if the other countries are ahead of us, then we are developing, and we have got to be, uh, try and see whether we are going to catch up with that. I just hope, wish, one day there would be an egalitarian world and we wouldn't talk about developed and developing because that we will all look so much alike, uh, but that is not going to happen in our lifetime, uh, it looks like. Role of capital controls. Let me say this, that uh, there's sometimes an illogic about it. You want access to other people's savings, but you don't want them to have access to yours. It's like a different kind of uh, protectionism. Now, we have in South Africa, we are stupid enough uh, to uh, call them uh, exchange controls because there are people who are clever around the world who call them capital flow measures. And, um, and for a long time, we had uh, this. And the idea, whole idea was that apartheid South Africa believed it wanted to create a lager and insulate itself from the rest of the world, so it wanted to capture all the capital there. 
with democracy, we said, we want to open up. And we were opening up. And at some stage in 1998, we actually got advice from the IMF that said that we think you are moving too fast in your liberalization. Can you please slow down? And um, eventually, by the 2000s, what we said we would do is to reform so that we are in compliance with the OECD code on uh, capital uh, liberalization. And that is the approach that we have taken. Uh, can this be used for macroprudential? It's something that exists in the toolkit. Like many macroprudential tools, I don't think its efficacy has been, uh, has been tested. And in a way, it, is, it could also be dangerous because at the time that you decide to put the capital flow measures, the interpretation of capital could be you know something they don't know and they panic even more and then you, you might just find that you actually make the problem uh, worse than it would have otherwise uh, had been. But they are there. They are a tool that countries uh, could use. They should be used judiciously. OK, let me pick up the question, uh, Richard, you raised on, on cryptos and, and payments. Within the FSB, if we look at financial innovations, uh, we always have this overarching frame that we want to harness the benefits while mitigating the risks. Now, if you apply that phrase to the crypto area, there is a legitimate question still out there. What actually are the benefits to society of a lot of the crypto asset global stablecoin uh, activities? If you take the three functions uh, uh, that we have of money, none of them uh, currently satisfies uh, these, uh, these three roles of, uh, of money. But at the same time, what we see is, of course, there is a strong investor demand for, uh, for crypto assets. Um, there is no global agreement to ban cryptos, uh, let alone if there was an agreement whether we could actually operationalize such a ban. So the emphasis uh, from the financial stability perspectives has come from, let's say, two things. First of all, to the extent that deficiencies in our traditional global cross-border payments world where we're one of the sources of this crypto space to flourish, we should address these weaknesses. That's the reason why we have this global cross-border payments uh, agenda, a G20 agenda, again, uh, that you, uh, together with Fabio Panetta from Banca d'Italia, that you coordinate within the uh, FSB. And the other one is to try to come up with an as convincing as possible global framework of regulating crypto asset activities and global stablecoins. Regulating huh, the well-known risks in this space like AML, CFT, like huh, insufficient uh, separation of funds, uh, intransparent governance uh, huh, structures in these crypto conglomerates, etc. There is a host of very traditional investor protection issues that also play a role in, in this area and that we have tried to capture as much as we can. Actually, Andrew has been huh, leading this exercise within one of the standing committees of the Financial Stability Board to come up with a set of workable standards to mitigate this risk as much as possible. But then again, let me conclude by saying its effectiveness will depend entirely on the preparedness of individual jurisdictions to implement and to collectively also think about a regime, how to deal with non-cooperative jurisdictions. Because at the end of the day, I repeat myself, you can take your server under your arm to any place in the world where you can start up these activities. And that the jury is simply still out as to how effective we will uh, be here. Good, there is still one minute left, so at least one more question. Maybe we have a few minutes to run over. Yes, to the left, the lady in the green there, please. Hi, thank you. It's a question for the governor of South Africa. I was really interested in your comment that inflation targeting works because over so much of my career, there's always been this perennial uh, sort of challenge to the framework after the GFC, you know, what about asset bubbles? And then when we were in this period of below target inflation that uh, 
uh, maybe we should change elements of the framework. And again, more recently, people talking about raising the target or putting a band, et cetera. We haven't talked much about it today, but uh, just really interested to hear about, from your perspective, uh, what do you think are some of the lessons for the DM uh, economies? You know, we maybe shouldn't be throwing away the inflation targeting framework just yet. Uh, uh, is DM developed markets or is it? <laughs> 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 uh, this, uh, these concepts, uh, these concepts move, uh, uh, move a lot. I will paraphrase one political scientist who said that uh, uh, if you thought democracy is bad, try the alternative. And I will put this and say that if inflation targeting framework is not working, what is an alternative monetary policy framework? We have come a long way, and in developing countries we had had countries that would have exchange rate packs. Uh, there was a time when countries were uh, pursuing uh, uh, money supply targets and uh, and in my own country, we had a framework that was called an eclectic monetary policy, which basically meant that uh, the governor could justify moving rates at will because they just pick up which indicator and says, if you look at this indicator, therefore, uh, that was problematic. And I think that the lesson of the inflation targeting framework is that it is clear you have got an anchor and um, uh, and if you have an independent central bank to execute that framework even better and just understand that the, other, the flip side of independence is transparency and accountability because that is how you, you, sustain, uh, you sustain the framework. And I think that we should not be too defensive either. We should allow society, if in a democracy, if people want to question the framework, we must engage with that. Because I don't know, maybe there might be an alternative. So far, all the alternatives that have been put on the table have not been credible. And, and, and so this is the framework that actually uh, works. And now and then, I think that a number of central banks from the ECB to the uh, BOE to the Fed have had revisions. They tweaked uh, the frameworks to make sure that the framework is more, is more robust. And, Apart from that, I am not sure that I can help you. Thank you very much. I think this concludes the, today's discussion. I had no doubt that we would have more than enough ground to cover. And indeed, there is still, uh, I think, a whole array of issues that we didn't uh, touch upon. But nonetheless, thank you very much uh, for being with me here. Thank you very much for being with us. And that concludes uh, also this, uh, this session. Thanks. Thank you.